Good morning and welcome back to I'll Knit If I Want To. This is Andrew Mowry of Drea Renee Knits. And this is where I answer your questions that you so kindly send in. Um, for those of you who've been asking where to send in your questions, I always put a link down below in the show notes. So if you look just below this video, you're gonna see where it says like the name of what it is and then it says show more click that show more and that's where i always put all the links for like my newsletter the link to ask your questions whatever i'm wearing which today happens to be the velicor tea i'll uh, link to that below it's gonna be nice and warm here today and i'm also wearing my overalls i just sewed so i've been getting real excited about sewing lately i pulled out my sewing machine for the first time since we moved so over two years ago and now it's all I want to do. So this is the Greer jumpsuit and I love it. So um, anyways, I also wanted to show before we jump into the questions for my knitting and spinning, I have been trying to think of a way to document my projects because my knitting is so well documented because it's my job and um, I spend so much time with my patterns that they're kind of really locked in. But for my spinning and my sewing, they get briefer moments in my life and I do not have a great memory. I wanna stop saying that. I hope that if I just start saying I have an awesome memory that my memory will improve. But um, for those times when I can't trust it, I want to be better at documenting what I've done so I can remember, especially with like spinning, I wanna know where did I get this fiber? What is this fiber? What, how I spun it in case I want to replicate that again. And then same with sewing, I want to know what pattern I used, what size I did. I do keep my cutouts from my tracing paper, um, but even the fabric and just a way to kind of celebrate making something. It's kind of fun to have a place to put it, to be like, look at what I did. So anyways, I got this as a gift for Mother's Day from my siblings and they got me this cute little journal and some pens because they know I love journals and pens and so I knew I needed a visual so I got an Instax uh, little Fujifilm instant camera like a Polaroid and so now I'm just taking little Polaroids and jotting down my notes so I thought I'd show you all for anyone else who's kind of like me who wants to have a record but for me if I'm gonna do it and keep up with it it has to be kind of quick and easy or there's just never enough time in the day so I won't continue um so anyways this is kind of what it looks like so I just do a little Polaroid and stick it in there with some washi tape and then I just write what the pattern was the size I made and any notes I have the fabric I used so this is kind of it so far so this is the jumpsuit I'm wearing um, so I'm going to be doing that for my spinning as well, which I already had a notebook started for that, but now I am going to go back and pull out the yarn I've spun and take little Polaroids and put that in there. Cause especially with my spinning, I was like, I'm not, I do have little tags and I try to, you know, really write what it was, what I did and everything. But I think being able to see a picture next to all my notes will make it even better. So anyways, that was just kind of a fun side project I'm doing that I thought somebody else might be interested in doing themselves. All right, let's get into some questions. So question number one, I wanted to ask you, um, I wanted to ask if you have any recommendations for a spinning wheel. I'm thinking of starting to spin, but feel overwhelmed by the choices out there. Can you share your experience with spinning and the wheel and maybe other tools you have chosen and why? So yeah, I first learned how to spin actually back when I lived in New Zealand and I got a spinning wheel as a gift and the woman who we got it from actually taught me how to spin and her son was a merino sheep farmer on the South Island of New Zealand and that was a pretty amazing experience because she had you know wool from him straight off the sheep I don't think it even been scoured or cleaned or anything it's very lanolin rich um and she had journals of like she would did a lot of natural dyeing and it was a really neat experience um but when i moved back to the us i did not get to bring my wheel with me and many years passed and i did not spin um for a long time i felt like i just wouldn't have time for that and being a designer 
there was the how will I ever have time to use the yarn I spin? Can I use it in designs? Kind of navigating that. Um, it kind of started out as, well, I'll knit gifts for like my family or, um, you know, find ways to use it like that. But I actually found that I knit with it a lot. I really, really love knitting with hand spun. It's just a really fun experience. And now I know I can always knit up a second sample um, and have my testers use other yarns that are, you can just buy instead of having to spin yourself. So anyways, I'm kind of getting distracted there, but I love spinning. I ended up right after we moved to Maine, I found out that Casey at Port Fiber taught spinning classes and I just was like, I want another creative outlet besides just knitting because knitting is my work. I very much um, love my knitting and it will always be like my kind of biggest craft love and what I turn to whenever I need to relax or whatever it may be. But it's really nice to have a different creative outlet. And the great thing about going and taking a class and learning how to spin is she has a whole bunch of different wheels and you could try any of them out and really figure out what one suits you best. Um, and it was myself and another student and we did pick different wheels. I think it's very per a personal choice. They're also can be very pricey. I mean, they kind of run anywhere from a couple hundred dollars to well over a thousand dollars. And so I think just seeing where kind of in that range fits you best, fits your body best. You want a single treadle, double treadle, all that. So like if you can actually try them out, I think that's really helpful. I ended up getting the Shocked Matchless, which those are made in Colorado. I really, really love it. I had, I actually did a question on Instagram in my stories and asked people like, what's the wheel to get? And I got tons of responses. Um, I think I posted them. You might be able to look at my Instagram highlights. I wonder if that's still there. Uh, Cause I did go through and kind of see like, okay, I tallied what everybody said, like how many each one got. Um, and the match list definitely got a bunch. And my friend who was a professional spinner for quite some time recommended the match list. So that kind of helped sway me. I also love that they have um, some of the like tensioning areas, they actually use bike parts. And I was a big cyclist for a long time. And so I loved that too. Um, but yeah, I love that wheel. It's worked really well for me, um, but it is an investment. And so I highly recommend if you can, if you live somewhere where you can try out a couple wheels, I would definitely try a few different out and see what works for you before spending a whole bunch of money on one. Uh, and again, taking a class I found really helpful. I think that got me over the hump. I didn't get through when I lived in New Zealand because there I only had like a couple hours with the woman who taught me and then I was on my own and it was, I don't know that it truly ever clicked for me where now I've gotten to the point where I'm spinning yarn that I really love to knit with. I'm really excited about the yarn I'm spinning and it definitely helped to take a class to kind of get me there. All right, question number two, what is the best pattern for learning brioche? So I would say my Harlow hat. I actually designed my Harlow hat. Do I have one behind me? I do. I've shown this before. So the Harlow hat is a two color brioche hat. It's reversible. For this one, I used Brooklyn Tweed Loft and then Spin Cycle Wools dyed in, Spin Cycle Wools, Spin Cycle Yarns dyed in the wool. I'm a little tired today. <laughs> um, and I designed it for new briochers. So there is video tutorials all the way from the cast on through the decreases. And I show them both English and continental style knitting. And all those videos are linked right in the pattern. So that's what I would suggest. You can find it in um, the link down below. And yeah, that's another thing though. Brioche, again, I think I've said this here before. If you can knit pearl, slip a stitch and do a yarn over, then you already have all the tools you need to do a brioche. 
I recommend just going slow, being really nice to yourself, realizing that you're manipulating your hands a little bit different than you usually would for like stockinette fabric. And so it's just about slowing down so that your brain and your hands have enough time to talk to each other. It's also a great thing to learn in a class if you have the opportunity to do so, because sometimes our brain and hands just don't really like to talk. And a teacher who can look over your shoulder a lot of times can spot what could be going wrong really quickly. So brioche is actually my favorite thing to teach. I'm going to be teaching it twice this year. I'm really excited. Um, but Harlow hat is a good place to start. All right, question number three. Do, oh, so I had so many questions on weaving in ends. Here's a couple of them. Uh, do you weave in your ends in a shawl before or after you block? Before. Because of how much you stretch a shawl when blocking, I'm not sure. It seems it would be different than a sweater. How do you keep the ends of the yarn from peeking out after weaving them in? Mine seem to eventually work themselves out so that I will see little ends peeking, peeking out. Um, and then another question was, do you have a technique for weaving in ends as you knit in the round? So as I said, there was a whole bunch of them, but they were all kind of along this line. So I just wanted to talk about how I weave in ends. I actually just went to peek if I have a tutorial for how I weave in ends and I have it for brioche, but not for just regular knitting. So I am going to film that hopefully today. And my goal is to have it up by Tuesday, um, which I have a pattern coming out Tuesday and it's newsletter day. So if you're not already signed up, there's a link below sign up and you'll get the new tutorial pattern discount all that good stuff on Tuesday. Um, but weaving in ends, my favorite way to weave in ends is just duplicate stitch. So I duplicate stitch, whether it's on the knit side or the purl side, but the trick to it that I have found works best for me is I weave in ends before blocking, but I do not trim the tails until after blocking. And that gives your knits when they're in the bath, kind of wiggling around and then you pull it out and roll it up and you're stepping on it, squishing it around, stretching it out, patting it flat, whatever kind of knit it is, stretching it, all of that, those ends get to move around where they need to be so that you, if you've already cut them, then there's a good chance you're gonna kind of stretch where you wove in that end and that's when you're gonna get those little ends that pop out. Now, there are some yarns that are just gonna be slippery and have more of a tendency to pop out. I find that with wear and washing, just like everything, it is this magic thing that happens to knitting where everything settles into place, things kind of felt together and they get all happy and cuddly with each other and it doesn't happen as much. Um, but Nancy Martian, does she puts a little fabric glue on her ends so if you're using a really slippery yarn and it's just something that drives you bonkers you could do a little tiny dot of fabric glue on there to keep that end from popping out um i haven't tried it but i know she does it and i was like mm, it's not a bad idea uh especially if it's something that kind of drives you bonkers for me where it, i find it to be more of an issue is like on a shawl because you can see it we're on a sweater if that end pops up a little bit no hopefully no one's looking at the inside of your sweater so it doesn't really matter um but definitely try weaving in pre-blocking trimming tails post blocking and you might find that that helps quite a bit and I'll show how I do that duplicate stitch weaving in events in that next tutorial. Um, now I don't weave in ends as I go. It's very rare for me to do that. I, I get, I did show spit splicing in an earlier video. I'm a huge fan of if you're doing like a one, I just finished a one color sweater and it was so great because I had like four ends to weave in like collar, hem, cuffs, done. I guess there's underarms too. Uh, but I loved how easy that was because I just spit spliced my way through it so that I basically had one long yarn for the whole sweater. Um, so if you're curious about that, it's in a previous episode. I'm going to admit right here, I'm not great about remembering what was in each episode. So just watch them all. <laughs> um, and for me, I save my weaving in events a lot of times for when I'm going to like watch a movie with my husband or I'm hanging or maybe I'm chatting with people where I don't want to be too distracted because I find it to be kind of a, like I don't have to put a lot of thought into it as I do it. So that's what I save it for and I just get them all done. Um, so yeah, I don't really do the weave in as you go. So I don't have a lot of tips there. I've definitely tried things throughout the years, but I 
tend to feel like they're kind of bulky. So I kind of like just doing it at the end. Uh, one thing I will do, especially if I'm using maybe kind of a slippery yarn where I want it to lock in a little bit better. Let's say I can't add in a new yarn at an edge and I have to do it like in the middle of a sweater or something. I do like to almost like doing color work, holding one, like my old yarn in one hand and my new yarn in the other hand. And I'll go every other stitch for a little bit, like knit one stitch with my old yarn, one stitch with my new yarn. And I keep doing that for just like maybe six stitches. And I like that because then you don't have one loosey goosey spot. Um, but it's about as fancy as I get. All right, next question. What do you do? Oh, I got a lot of this as well. What do you do when your gauge is perfect for the stitch count, but too tight for the row count? This happens to me a lot. Um, they say that the row count is not that important because you can adjust the length, but sometimes my gauge is so tight that the fabric ends up very stiff. And this particular person already knits tight. And so and uses metal needles. So they're worried that if they try switching needle material, as I've spoken about before, to kind of try and adjust that gauge, they're worried that then it would tighten up even more on a wood needle, which I agree. Um, and then another person who's asking a very similar question said, how come sometimes you can have the perfect stitch gauge, but row gauge is completely off? Is it just the yarn? Is there something you can do to try and fix it in order to get the gauge needed? I know row gauge doesn't matter in some cases, but with round yoke sweaters, it's pretty significant. So again, I got a ton of this question asked in similar ways. I once had the pleasure of teaching at the same retreat as Clara Parks, who's written a bunch of wonderful knitting books. And she teaches a class on swatching and has every student swatch with the same size needle and the same yarn. And I've seen a picture of them all with their swatches and it is amazing how every single one of them is different. So it's not just the yarn, it is not just the needle, it's us. We are all unique human beings. We're all, we're all, you know, a perfect little snowflake. And so are our swatches and our nets. And generally speaking, I think it's actually more rare to get perfect gauge on both um, stitch and row. So, it's it's kind of being able to trust that knitwear is flexible and stretchy and little tiny discrepancies are probably gonna be okay. Uh, but also, so what I wanted to talk a little bit about, I've mentioned in the past, depending on your knitting, you can absolutely try using a different needle material. So, if you were using metal, you can try switching to wood and vice versa. And a lot of times that is enough to change your gauge. I'll also say so it depends on if you are knitting flat or knitting in the round. And if you're doing large circumference or small circumference in the round. So for instance, and just to show how finicky that row gauge can be, when I knit my body, if I'm knitting a sweater and I'm knitting the body and then I go to knit the sleeves, I pretty much always will go up one needle size for the sleeves. My stitch gauge will stay exactly the same. My row gauge will change. So that just shows like even just between, I'm using the same yarn, the same, you know, it's me knitting it and it's just the circumference of the knitting that's changing and that affects my gauge. It tightens up my stitches so I have to go up a needle, but then my row gauge changes. So for something like a sleeve, I know that, well, I'm just going to knit it to how long I need it. But yes, with things like patterning, um, yokes, it, it, that row gauge is important. But in a lot of sweaters, you do have some wiggle room before or after like your yoke depth. Like it's okay. If you think about how you want to wear a sweater, you don't want that underarm right up in your armpit. And so it can be nice. You can add a little length there like you can have some wiggle room that way if your row gauge is a little bit longer than what's intended it might not make or break the sweater especially if you ever want to layer it over a shirt having a little extra room there is definitely not a bad thing 
Um, but in the case of the first question, when they said they already are, feel like they're such a tight knitter that if they switch to wood to try and figure out this discrepancy, it's just going to tighten them up more. I would not switch to wood. I do agree. So if, if you don't know this, um, I think I mentioned it in an earlier one, but metal needles have more slip and so they don't grip the yarn as much and so it helps loosen up gauge. Wood needles do have more grip and so it's going to hang on to the yarn a little bit more and it's going to help tighten up gauge. So you can kind of choose what needle might better suit your personal knitting depending on if you tend to be a little loose or a little tight. Um, for this particular person I would maybe consider switching your knitting style. I had, I taught my neighbor how to knit and it was so incredibly tight that it wasn't even enjoyable for her to knit because she felt like she was kind of battling it. And then she switched and it loosened up and it was such a more joyful experience for her. So you might want to consider trying a different style of knitting to see if that can kind of help with some of these gauge issues because issues because one of the most important things is that you are also getting a fabric you like. If that fabric is stiff, for one, I would be surprised that that's the gauge for the pattern unless it's something that needs a stiff gauge. But generally we do want some drape. A lot of what we're knitting, you know, you want some drape and movement. So I would also make sure I would almost be curious about yarn choice even there. That might be looking at changing the weight of the yarn you're using um, because that kind of sounds to me like maybe the yarn weight is too heavy for the project. Like let's say you're using a worsted but maybe a DK would work out better. So play around with that. It's not all about the needles. It can also be about your yarn choices. Um, and so again, swatching too. It's really important to remember to block your swatches, especially with row and round gauge, because that will change significantly with blocking a lot of the times. And you also want to think about knitting a large enough swatch. Once we knit something like a sweater, you have to think about the weight of that yarn. That's going to pull down on that fabric and that's going to stretch out that row gauge more, um, especially if it's a non super, I'm sorry, a super wash wool that stretches quite a bit up to an inch more than a non super wash would. So some people even kind of hang up their swatches to dry if they're going to be wearing it as a sweater, they want to see how much it's going to grow. So it's also nice to take a pre blocking measurement on that swatch and then measure it again after you block it so you can kind of see how much it changed but make sure you're blocking that swatch because otherwise you're not getting a true read on what your gauge is going to be for that project unless you don't plan on ever washing or blocking your project um and then lastly make sure you are swatching how that project is going to be knit so if it's going to be knit flat swatch flat if it's going to be knit in the round swatch in the round i've talked about this before i've thrown out some links before so take again a peek back through those old episodes i need like an assistant to help me keep track of all this uh, we're going to keep it really low key here folks all right last question how do you block sweaters so they don't end up with a visible fold on the top of the sleeve so i don't I don't. I don't mind that, but I totally understand why people would. Uh, what we're talking about here is when you lay a sweater down flat to block, you're going to get this ridge along here because it's all flattened out instead of in a tube. So what you can do, you can do a couple of different things. Um, I, in the past, when I did not want to have that little fold seam in there, was you can just take plastic like grocery bags, if you still have any and push those in the sleeve and then it's nice and round and let it dry and anything like that anything spherical that you can put in your sleeve to kind of help so that it's not just lying really flat and folded um the reason i suggest something like a plastic bag is because it won't soak in any moisture so it will help the moisture to evaporate um i have in the past when i was doing it was a cowl that I didn't want to crease in. And so I actually used paper towel tubes on either side and that worked out really well. Um, so anything just to kind of bump it up, it doesn't even have to fully fill the sleeve. It can just be enough so that there's no creases anywhere. 
Um, so that's what I would do. But I tend to be a little too lazy for that. So I, I just lay mine flat to dry. All right, we have a bonus question that I'm a little reluctant to do because I feel like doing it on here, it won't work. But I get a lot of questions about my bun and how I do it. So I'm going to show you, but watch it not look good when I try now. But basically, I think the trick is actually just using, I use a claw, like a little clippy claw. And I think that is what makes it work well for me. Um, so I just grab all my hair and I try to put it as forward as I can. And I just do that. And I take my little clip. And the nice thing about the clip is you can kind of just zhuzh it around to where you want it. I mean, it's not super, it's not like the most secure thing, but I mean, I, I work out like this and it seems to be okay. So that's all I do. I just take it all up and go like this and then clamp it. But that seems to work best for me. I have really fine hair and with my autoimmune disorders and after having my kids, I lost a ton of my hair um, and it never came back. So I think a clip works well for me because a rubber band just like makes it all disappear into this tiny little thing. So a claw seems to work well for me. The bonus is it also doesn't break your hair like a hair elastic will. So there's a bonus tip from an ex hairdresser. All right, I think that's all. Oh, I did want to touch back real quick. Thank you all so much for all the kind messages on my sharing about Hashimoto's and celiac and my ramble with it. It was really, really nice to read all of your kind comments and all of you who also have Hashimoto's or celiac or another autoimmune disease. And I did think after I finished recording that one, I wished I had said, you know, I think one of the things when you have to cook most of your food alone. So for me and where I'm at right now with trying to heal some of my symptoms and everything, I pretty much have to cook everything I eat. And that can get a little exhausting, especially running a business and I have little kids. And um, so I realized the other day as I threw together a soup on Friday night that I was able to throw together because I had homemade stock in the freezer and homemade meatballs in the freezer. Like I had everything I needed to like put the soup together. And I was like, oh, that is actually, I think my top tip is when you have the time cooking what you can and then freezing things. Because even if you have loads of time to cook, I have found that like, and I used to be a chef, so I, I really love cooking, but like you hit burnout, you hit fa cooking fatigue, where I think that's when some of those feelings of the frustration of having these restrictions can come in because there are times where I'm like, I just wanna be able to eat the pizza with like my husband and kids or like get takeaway or something like that, and I can't. And so when I know I have an option, like if I make us, it might be soup or there's a lasagna I make us that I can eat. I will always make sure to freeze a couple portions for myself so that even if I'm like, I don't have the energy to cook everyone dinner, I pull out my little freezer meal, they can do takeaway. And that has made a huge difference for me. So that would be a big one is using that freezer. Um, and also if you are interested, because I, love cooking so much. I went to culinary school. I used to be a baker and I, in my newsletter, I always have a section called Thought You Might Like and I include just things that I like that I think you'll like. So a lot of time, pretty much every week, there's at least one recipe and because I can't eat gluten, they are gluten free. Um, so anyways, if you're into that, again, sign up for my newsletter because I do share lots of fun little recipes and stuff there that we really like. Um, and yeah, I also got quite a few messages from people who do have Hashimoto's who had never heard that gluten connection. And um, so there was a couple people that you might want to go read about who've actually gotten their Hashimoto's into remission, which is what I am trying to do right now. And so Laurel Galucci, she owns Sweet Laurel. I have her cookbooks. They're fabulous. Her story, she's one of those people that had Hashimoto's and... Um, was able to get it into remission. Um, how did all the other ones just leave my brain? Anyways, 
if you google it you'll find a whole bunch of people but I do find it really helpful to read other people's stories, especially when I get into like my pity party moments when it all feels a little hard. Um, it's nice to read other people's success stories and see how amazing food is and how it can really have the ability to heal us. So, all right, have a great Friday. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for watching. Uh, ask me your questions, link below, and I'll see you next week.